It is popular to say that the 2011 Springboks were screwed out of the Rugby World Cup by bad refereeing. In this video, you are going to get a front row seat to a retrospective review. I will look back and give you my thoughts and we will also hear directly from some of the Springboks and coaching staff who were there. Let's get started. South Africa came to New Zealand as the defending champions and were hoping to become the first team in history to successfully defend the Webb Ellis Cup. The build-up had been good, it is fair to say. In 2008, Peter de Villiers took over as the new Springbok coach. Shockingly, Saru president Regan Hoskins announced at that very first press conference that de Villiers had been appointed not only for rugby reasons. Why would you do that? Why would you say that? Why would you throw P. Divi under the bus like that on day one? It would only fuel the fire of those who believed that he shouldn't have been appointed in the first place. Well, let's be honest. Coaches are judged on their results. So let's look at Divi's results. In 08, South Africa started with a two-test series against Wales, won both, then beat Italy and went overseas for the Tri-Nations, where we won one and lost two. That one victory was a famous result against the All Blacks in Dunedin, the first time we had ever won at the House of Pain, and it happened on my birthday as well, so thanks for the birthday present. Ricky January, you beauty. Unfortunately, there was also just one win and two defeats for the home leg of the Tri-Nations. We were beaten by New Zealand, then we were beaten by the Wallabies before beating the Aussies in the second match. So a mixed bag of results to say the least, but that one win over the Wallabies was a memorable 53-8 annihilation, Jongi Nokwe with four tries. In between we hammered Argentina 63-9 before going over to the UK for the end of year tour where we would play Wales, Scotland and England. We smashed the English 42-6. So not a bad first year for Peter de Villiers. Let's move into 2009. The year began with a series against the British and Irish Lions, a series which we would win. We won the first test in Durban, then we won a brutal contest at Loftus to take the series 2-0 before losing the third test, and then it was time for the Tri-Nations. It started beautifully with two wins over the All Blacks as well as a win over Australia before we would head overseas. We lost in Brisbane against the Aussies, but we did beat them in Perth, and then we completed a memorable win in Hamilton against the All Blacks to clinch the Tri-Nations. It also went on to prove, as P. Devi would admit, that there is in fact something that you can do in Hamilton. You can win the Tri-Nations there. But the end of year tour was not so good for South Africa. We lost to Ireland, lost to France and beat Italy, although the French defeat could possibly be blamed on Russ Dumisani's horrendous rendition of our national anthem. In 2010, the box struggled, losing four in a row at one stage. But it seemed a bit better in 2011. In the Tri-Nations, for example, we were able to beat New Zealand in Port Elizabeth just before going to the World Cup. A nice confidence booster. At this point, I'd like to point out that one thing Peter de Villiers did really, really well is beat the All Blacks. He managed five wins and six defeats against the New Zealanders during his time as Springbok coach, including two wins in the land of the Long White Cloud. The only other Springbok coach since readmission that can boast that kind of a positive record against the All Blacks is Nick Mallett. Say what you like about P. Divi, this is a man who knew how to beat the All Blacks. Off to the World Cup, and South Africa were probably not the outright favourites, but certainly among a group of teams that could be considered contenders for the title. We thought we had an easy pull, but we had to dig really deep against Wales to overcome them in our opening match. After that, we drilled Fiji and Namibia, and we were really up and running. After the 2010 competition, you, you, you got a bit of doubts, um, and uh, a lot of injuries happened from 2010 to 2011. So we were, we were hit uh, hard with a couple of injuries. Um, but obviously, we, the build-up to the World Cup, we were a bit slow out of the blocks. Um, and then getting into the World Cup, we just beat Wales, still finding our feet. Um, and then we got a nice game against Fiji, and then everything starts flowing. And the control and the old, the old team starts flowing again. But then we came up against Samoa, and we were only able to win 13-5. 
Yeah, the, the game against Samoa was uh, a, a very interesting game. We, we got into the lead quite early on and then, uh, you know, we sort of t uh, tended to, to uh, take our foot off the pedal a little bit. But uh, a game, uh, uh, one's got to give credit to Samoa. Samoa played particularly well. Uh, we probably gave them too much possession in the second half and uh, ended up having to defend our trial line. Uh, quite a bit, but uh, but you know the 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 problem that happened to us on that particular night was that we picked up some some injuries, um, and uh, that's exactly what you don't want in a World Cup. Is uh, you know you've got guys that you've sort of uh, earmarked to be your starting lineup, and uh, if you pick up injuries, it is a little bit disruptive. But uh, that's the nature of the game, so you've got to just uh, be able to roll with the punches. I think we got a bit. We got distracted um, as a as a group. Uh, we got distraction means you like you get off the ball stuff. I uh, got a bit of fight, a bit of uh, back chat, and uh, yellow cards start flowing, red cards start flowing. So yeah, so just a little bit of distraction. But uh, I think we was we were the whole the whole game. We were under control. Um, obviously, Samoa it felt like a home game because it's in. I think it was in Auckland and um, the whole Samoan crowd was there. So I think they played the best game of their lives against us. But we were never never felt like we we're going to lose the game. We never felt like we were in trouble. It's just small things. I think the distraction, I can say, is one of them. That's why we couldn't finish opportunities. And um, and um, it happens in rugby. Sometimes you just lose a bit of concentration. But the control to win the game was always there. So it's part of the game. Do you really know your rugby? Do you always get your predictions right? Why not make some money then? Open an account right now with Tic Tac Bets and get up to 2,000 Rand and 20 spins with your first deposit. The link is appearing on your screen and I'll also put it in the description area. Please note that this is an affiliate link and I will make a little commission on it. Winners know when to stop. National Responsible Gambling Program, toll free helpline 0800 006 008. No persons under the age of 18 years are permitted to gamble. Next up was the quarterfinal. Probably before the tournament began, we may have thought we were going to take on Ireland, who were in the same pool as Australia, and you probably fancy the Wallabies to overcome Ireland at that stage. However, the Irish pulled off the victory to top their pool, and that meant South Africa would take on the Aussies in Wellington. Now it's important to note something else here, as much as I was lauding Peter de Villiers for his record against the All Blacks a little bit earlier, similarly, his record against Australia was not that good. If you look at what has happened since readmission, what kind of happens, typically, is that in Australia the Wallabies beat the Springboks 90% of the time, but in South Africa the Springboks beat the Wallabies 90% of the time. That said, P. Divi suffered three defeats in four seasons at home against the Aussies. Between 2008 and 2011, the Australians won 8 out of 12 against the Box. So you could say that maybe Robbie Deans knew how to beat the Springboks or at least Peter de Villiers. But if we look at that quarterfinal against the Wallabies in Wellington, there are five things that need to be pointed out right now. Number one, South Africa dominated possession. Number two, South Africa dominated territory. Number three, the Springboks scored two tries that were ruled out by the referee. Number four, David Pocock was not blown for being offside, not once. Number five, Bryce Lawrence never refereed another match and he was subsequently promoted to become the head of referees in New Zealand. If that last point is not suspicious, then I don't know what is. However, having said all of that, here are three reasons why the Springboks should not complain. Number one, Australia did actually play quite well. It's not their fault that the refereeing performance was inept. Number two, the Springboks allowed themselves to be sucked into the way the Aussies wanted them to play and perhaps showed a little bit of naivety on that front. Number three, despite dominating territory and possession, the Springboks did not attempt a late drop goal to put themselves in the lead and just try and get out of there in the dying minutes. We were making a lot of uh, nervous errors. And it, uh, and it was quite frustrating that the decisions uh, and the bounce of the ball uh, wasn't kind of going, the refereeing decisions, that is, uh, weren't sort of going our way. And, uh, and you know, at the time, 
um, David Pocock was uh, was was giving us a tough time at the breakdown, and uh, we didn't uh, and 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 whether fairly or unfairly, but uh, we didn't cope with that very well. Uh, so we were turning the ball over, and 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 again, it was uh, just frustrating from. Uh, uh, you know, not not being able to get the reward where we needed to. For me, it's what it, how it feels like on the field was like, um, it's always going to happen. Um, we were in control. We were playing in the right areas. We we did everything right. Um, I think if you look, if you're going to be critical as a as a as a as a player, we we couldn't we couldn't uh, capitalize on opportunities. Uh, I think we had a lot of opportunities to to score the tries uh, to put scores, uh, points on the scoreboard. And we did not, um, and unfortunately, but it always felt like as a team that uh, we had that positive feeling, it's going to happen, we're going to score now, we're going to score now. And then obviously Patrick Lamby scored, um, felt like that's the game. Patrick Lamby scored, and next thing is a forward pass. So we always one step forward, two steps back the whole time in the game. So the mindset was there to go out and win it. Um, like I say, we just sometimes in rugby, you play your best rugby, but sometimes it doesn't work for you on the day. Yeah, when you talk about uh, that particular match, uh, often the referee uh, ref- referee uh, comes into play, and uh, and that's part of the game, you know. So one 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 needs to be able to handle that situation. Obviously, within in a knockout competition like that, it's very frustrating that uh, those decisions don't go your way. Um, however, you know, we we were a team that uh, that were good enough to to not. Be putting ourselves under the pressure of having to rely on refereeing decisions that go your way or don't go your way. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a uh, a World Cup, which you would feel that uh, we could have we could have progressed, and we were the team that uh, that uh, were able to beat New Zealand. And obviously, with them having gone on and won the World Cup, in hindsight, now you you say that South Africa. Could oppose that uh, the biggest threat to 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 the All Blacks, but again, you know it's all it's history, and uh, they did incredibly well, and it was a well deserved World Cup for them. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? You can click on my Patreon link. I'll put it on the screen as well as in the description box, and there will be great benefits for members. By the way, the winner of that quarterfinal would go on to face the host nation in the semis. And I have a theory that goes as follows, if you'll humour me for a few moments. I mentioned Peter de Villiers' excellent record against New Zealand. We also know that between 1987 and 2011, the All Blacks pretty much dominated rugby in between the World Cups, but they were unable to get the job done at the actual tournament. They'd come short in the final against the box in 95, they were beaten in the semi-finals in 91 and 99 as well as 03, and of course in 07 they were beaten in the quarterfinals. No doubt this is something that weighed on them and they would have been very conscious of it at the tournament that they were hosting in 2011. The pressure to actually win the tournament that year must have been immense, and I think that had they come up against the Springboks in the semi-final, there would have been even more nerves on the part of the Kiwis. I think they would have panicked. Not freaked out panicked, but I think they would have panicked. South Africa, who specialise in Rugby World Cup knockout matches and tight, tense situations, I think would have come out on top and gone on to win the Rugby World Cup ultimately. And I understand that there's a little bit of contradiction there because if we were so good at knockout matches, we would have beaten Australia. But again, Bryce Lawrence. Anyway, we'll never know. In no small part, thanks to the now Head of Referees in New Zealand. And needless to say, many of those within the box squad were not impressed. The Australian game, I think think we played our best rugby, but um, if you look back, we played our best rugby, we just, the scoreboard wasn't in our favour at the end of the day. And uh, if we beat Australia in the quarterfinals, I think nobody could have stayed in our way because we just peak at the right time. And just unfortunately, uh, that's how rugby works sometimes. Uh, you play your best rugby, but the scoreboard may, is against you sometimes. Yeah, it's all uh, it's all <laughs> hypothetical, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know, you want, one can think whatever you want, but uh, the situation is that, you know, you lose a quarterfinal, you're gone, you know. Uh, what could have happened in the semi-final? 
uh, yeah, that's that's just how long is a piece of string, you know. But for me, uh, we really felt that uh, we we had the measure of the All Blacks, and uh, had we won that uh, that quarter final, we would have played against the All Blacks. So I'll leave it to your judgment to uh, to call it as you wish. I can talk personally because we had that feeling and a belief in the team that we we're gonna we can beat anyone in this, in this competition and. Uh, we didn't we beat New Zealand already in South Africa in uh, in PE, so we have that already that that uh, mental switch that we can beat them. Uh, and obviously we defending champions, and obviously they will panic because they're home ground and uh, they they have to play for their people, so they're gonna be under a huge pressure. And unfortunately, we couldn't we couldn't uh, play that game. But if if we rewind and replay it back now and. I think we'll, we'll definitely would have beaten the All Blacks uh, in, in Auckland. Now, instead of being bitter about it, I say let's instead congratulate New Zealand. They are one of the great rugby nations, and it was good from their point of view that they could win the World Cup on home soil for their people in 2011. Congratulations to New Zealand. Let's not have sour grapes. In spite of what I've just said, there is no actual proof of cheating, and perhaps one way of looking at it is to say that in 1995 we had Susie, and in 2011 they had Bryce Lawrence. And let's leave it at that. Thank you so much for watching. This video is part of a retro review series I'm doing, where we look back at all of the Springboks World Cup performances over the years. See you next time.